oh, I'm going to go get some more water. I run upstairs. I'm like, watching yeah. the TV. I'm like, oh, I have to get back upstairs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's been five minutes. That's yeah. a little bit longer rest than I'm used to taking. <laughs> Convince me to watch this race. Why Why should I tune in? Why should I be a part of this this weekend? What other live sports are you watching this weekend? <laughs> yeah. On today's episode of Distance Training, we have James Hinchcliffe, an IndyCar driver. And with the season not on track, an iRacing circuit is, we'll explain. And one of the more athletic couples you'll ever meet is trying their best to stay both physically and mentally sharp. And that's exactly where we begin. Okay, so we are joined now by two-time Olympic medalist and Super Bowl champion, Kendall Coyne Schofield and Michael Schofield. Uh, first and foremost, how are you guys? How are your family? How's everything going right now? Well, Jack, we're, we're doing well. Um, we're very fortunate to say everybody in our families are healthy, uh, sane, staying inside, um, and our hearts really go out to those who have been affected by the coronavirus, those loved ones that have, have come down with it, and especially those who are on the front line battling this disease. So we're able to be inside, and our, we, our special thanks goes out to Michael's dad, who's yeah. the chief of our town, and so he's been working around the clock, and his brother, Andrew, who's also a firefighter. So um, we've seen the work that they've put in, um, but so we're extremely thankful to all of those who are the essential workers and keeping our country moving while the rest of us are not. <laughs> We're trying not to. <laughs> exactly. Hang on now. The, the chief of the town, Michael, what, what does that mean? You got to explain he's the what that means. My dad's been the fire chief in our hometown of Orland Park for the last, I don't, I don't want to, about over five years at least for sure. So he's been doing that for a while, but he's been a firefighter for the last 40 years. And then my brother just started in a neighboring town uh, actually yesterday. When, when do you guys feel like the first time you realized that this was going to be something extremely serious? Well, I think it hit me before yeah. Well, um, yeah. him because on March 7th, uh, the Women's World Championships were canceled. We were uh, in, I was in Phoenix, Arizona with the Professional Hockey uh, Players Association and uh, we were at breakfast and that morning we found out our Women's World Championships were canceled. Um, and a lot of us were a little confused, a little devastated at the time, not hearing other sporting events in North America being canceled. But I think that was really the true indicator of what was coming to North America, what was coming to the United States, yeah. because it was really one of the first sporting events canceled in North America. Um, and obviously the Women's World Championships incorporates the other half of the world. So uh, it shows what had happened already in different parts of the world and what was coming for us. Yeah, it was the same for me. You know, I, I remember even a couple of days before that, I was supposed to be, I was looking at flights because it was in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. So I'm looking at flights and I'm like, I don't even know if I should book this yet because I just kept, I just had the feeling in the back of my head that this could be getting bad and they could start postponing things. So I just even held off on post uh, booking my flight. And then she finally got the, she finally texted me or called me saying it got canceled. And I was just like, that's when it hit me. Like, this is going to be a big deal, you know? Both of you as professional athletes, what's the hardest part about being stuck at home? Uh, I think it's, it's waking up every day. And I think this is relevant to everybody. It's waking up every day um, with the feeling that you can't accomplish what you want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. You can't reach that peak uh, performance. You can't reach, you know, every day you, you have to find a, a moral victory in what you're doing. Um, because we know with the limitations that we have, we can't, you know, train to the capacity that we want. You know, I, all the ice rinks are closed, um, but I'm in a position where I don't have anything till August. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit less stressed than he is because he starts well, whenever. Yeah. We don't know when we're starting. Obviously we got a memo from the NFL saying our OTAs and all that stuff is postponed, but obviously it was supposed to start April 20th. And now with the news the other day saying the social distancing is going to go until April 30th, obviously that's going to be pushed back and it could be pushed back even further. So we just have no idea when we have to be reporting. And then obviously our, our big stress was just as soon as it started going down and gym started closing all everywhere we had a chance to work out started closing we were like we need to find a way to work out so i knew it was like a couple of days before our governor of illinois was going to do the uh, uh, stay in place the shelter in place announcement we booked dumbbells we got bands we were running just like dick sporting goods to get, just to get whatever we could and just throw it in our <laughs> throw it in our basement so now it's just been now that's just been the hassle like all right we got two dumbbells we got a bunch of bands we got a stationary bike let's make the best of it and see what we could do to stay in shape so it's been it's definitely been hard every single day coming up with workouts and doing stuff but we're making the most of it we're, we've been doing I think, it, it, I think the heart the, what's what's really challenging and I'm sure a lot of athletes have the same uh, challenges 
you, when you're in your basement and you're in your home, you're in an environment that's usually comfortable to you that yeah. you're usually you come back after working out and you're, you're relaxing and you're, you're doing anything, but you know, physical activity and, and mm -hmm. to be an elite athlete. So I think when it's hard being in home in, in our home working and out. working out and trying to, you know, get to that peak performance mentally and physically and then at the same time it's like your phone rings you're like oh i'm just gonna grab that that's it's fine like and trying to stay yeah. on track because there's so many distractions in an environment in which you you yeah, never definitely. really utilized as you know workout. yeah your, yeah, your gym, gym your yeah, lab yeah. your your place to you know to to be as professional as you can in your sport and so i think for me it's like oh i'm gonna go get some more water i run upstairs i'm like watching yeah. the tv i'm like oh i gotta get back <laughs> upstairs exactly yeah. it's been five minutes that's yeah. a little bit longer rest than i'm used to taking <laughs> yeah for us uh former high school athletes that's what we're used to you know that's that's the typical routine right there. that's what gets you through yeah. uh, a workout if you will so, so both of you have plenty of time on your hands right yeah. now. Have we rewatched a 2018 gold medal match? Have we rewatched a <laughs> yeah. Super Bowl championship? What, how have you been spending the time? So uh, Sunday at one o'clock, uh, NBC had the 2018 Winter Olympic game on. And that was the first time I've rewatched it in its entirety. Um, I've worked alongside Kenny Albert a few times and I told Kenny, I'm like, goodness, your voice is behind all these big moments in my life, whether it was that game or the fa fastest skater competition in San Jose. And so I was texting back and forth with him. It was so great to hear, you know, hear his call, hear AJ's call, hear Pierre's call for the first time um, behind, you know, arguably my uh, greatest sporting moment of my life. Um, so we got in the uh, third period and over time, she's pedaling faster and faster, you know, as the game would pick up, her speed would pick up and you could tell she was like totally reliving everything and just like yelling at the TV and like, that's a penalty. How'd the refs not see that stuff? So it was so funny to see that, but there hasn't been any, my Super Bowl hasn't been on in anything, but like, it's been cool, I guess. Your one game say, in Mexico was. Yeah. So we've watched a couple games. It's like the NFL Network's won a bunch of old games. I've been watching a lot of the old, those old uh, NCAA tournament games that they were showing, like Christian Leitner's shot the other day was on or Michael Jordan mm -hmm. back in the eighties hitting the game winner. So it's been cool to watch those, I guess, but you know, we're more making the most of it. Obviously we watched the Tiger King along with probably 90% of America. I feel like to watch that. So we watched that in about a day. But like you said, a lot of time in our hands. So we're just trying to find the most, most to do with it. So, so what was more entertaining, the 2018 gold medal match or Tiger King? <laughs> <laughs> well, Definitely the gold medal this. match. Tiger, Tiger King. <laughs> that, that was a trick question. That's a, yeah. the right answer. All right, I know. So I felt like everyone was watching the Tiger King. All my siblings were like, you got to watch, you got to watch. And I'm watching. I'm like, these people like, are just the craziest. Like, this is just like Joe Exotic. Like the perfect name for the entire show. Like the whole thing was just exotic. <laughs> but obviously the gold medal game, you know, I was like out back on my seat, edge of my seat again, watching it all. I knew it was going to happen, but it was still just such a good game. Just well, I, can, awesome I was, I was and, on the bike and I started pedaling and he comes down and he has his like coin 26 jersey. I was like, yeah. oh, this just got real. So this is my like, only chance to get to wear a sport jersey in a while. So I'm going to take advantage of it. <laughs> so that was really fun. And I'm like watching it. I'm like, oh, what are you doing, Kendall? Because like, <laughs> I really haven't watched it. So, it, you know, you're looking at all the mistakes and, but it was really, it was awesome to watch because it, it provided optimism for, you know, for the future. And it made me excited to get back on the ice. And um, I think just hearing from so many of my teammates and seeing how excited they were. And I heard from so many people I haven't heard from, whether it was the first time they've watched the game, which is, yep. which is really unique in itself, considering we're two years later and I'm getting the same messages I got two years ago. Congratulations on winning. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> like, you know, and, and I, uh, you know, I had one person email me. I've never seen it. It was actually uh, the musician who was at our wedding and he emailed us and he said, I've never seen a shootout before. That was really cool. <laughs> um, so it's just, you know, there's a, there's definitely moments through this pandemic that have provided optimism and you know have helped us get through the day and I would say the replay of sports has definitely been one of those and I yeah. really felt it when our Olympic game was on because so many people were reaching out saying that was so awesome it was a great two-hour break from the news that I needed and mm -hmm. just to know someone who was playing made it even better and so we've really watched a lot of old uh, sporting events I think what I, I saw one of my teammates former teammates posted on Facebook was uh, her national championship game from 2003 and it was Harvard versus Minnesota Duluth and I'm telling you I didn't even know college hockey existed 
in 2003. I was 11 years old. And for me to watch it, there were so many players in that game that I grew up looking up to. A lot of them I played with on the U.S. national team when I was young. And to see that game was just so cool because I played in the NCAA. I played women's college hockey. So I was able to relate to that game. And I, I turned to Michael. I said, is this what it feels like when you watch old NFL games mm -hmm. and he goes yeah like you can relate to what they're going through and I was like this is just so cool I mean granted it was a little broken it was definitely older footage but it was just for me I'm like I, it's so important to know the history of your sport and the history of anything mm -hmm. me like just to hear those play to hear those players names to see them and to see the game and the difference in the game from back then till now is just so cool to watch and so that to me has yeah. been one of the highlights of the the previous sporting events I've watched yeah, and just getting ready to talk to the two of you, I saw some footage where, where both of you were on the ice together. Kendall, I'm curious of what you think of Michael the skater. Michael the skater. I definitely improved. Let me, let me start off by saying... Did he ask you? Well, I'm throwing some of my input before she just burns me. I, so we've been together for six years now, and I started skating probably five years ago, and I only skate about, about 10... 10 to like 15 times a year, maybe not even that much. So I want to throw that out there before she starts burning me, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> thanks for the introduction on Michael the Skater. Um, he's gotten a lot better. I have. There's room for improvement. Definitely. I think the challenging part for Michael is that, you know, he's a little bit bigger than people who typically learn how to skate. Just a lot, a of, them, bit, a lot yeah. of them are younger kids and they're a little bit more fearless to fall. And so Michael right now is a little bit scared to fall, so he's yeah. not as comfortable. Big trees fall hard. <laughs> yeah, and, and Kendall, you were just a part of that first ever, too, women's, all women's broadcast team oh. to call a hockey game. What did that day mean to you? How did that all come together? It's crazy to me to think, you know, the day before that, my world championships got canceled, and then three days later, literally the NBA shut down, and then a day later, the NHL shut down. And that was a matter of three to four days after, and it just shows the, the seriousness of this yeah. pandemic and the escalation and how things just, you blinked and, you know, and your world changed. But going back to that Sunday in Chicago, the all-women's broadcast was incredible. For me, uh, it was just so, it was such an honor to be a part of because there were a lot of women who were there who paved the way for me as a young younger broadcaster um, you know in the industry and I what I love the most were the stories that were told beyond the faces that you see and the voices that you hear there's so many faces and voices that are behind the scenes and it really showed how many roles there are in sport for for young girls that you know just because you can't play in the NHL or you feel you're not good enough to go to the Olympic Games you there's a way to get there and I think all of those women that night proved that and speaking with them and learning their stories and hearing how many Olympic games they've been to. Yeah. They've been to way more than two, let me tell you. And, you know, and, and some of them said, I knew I wasn't good enough as an athlete to get the, get to the Olympics, but I was a good enough producer. I was a good enough director. I was a good enough camera, camera woman. And I got there and, you know, I accomplished my dream. And, you know, to hear, to hear that is, was so inspiring because, you know, I, I didn't know going through school as a communications major, how many really, jobs there are for people in sport you know as an athlete mm -hmm. myself I always thought well if you don't play you know that that's my dream is to play and to get there so now and and when I was going through the recruiting process that's why I wanted to do broadcasting because I always wanted to stay in sport because I knew my playing days were going to come to an end and and for me what I saw and what I heard were those faces and those voices so that's really what directed me to you know sideline reporting and then an, being an analyst and getting into that broadcasting role but I hope there were so many young people out there that saw that there are roles beyond the face and the voice that, that you see during the game. Mm -hmm, of course. So this is, the, uh, this is our lockdown lightning round now. We have three questions for you that we will ask all the guests. Number one is this. Past or present, anyone through time, who would you most want to join your quarantine crew? Mm. Mm. Do we both answer? Oh, yeah. You guys both answer. Yep. I feel like someone funny. Peyton oh, Manning. Wow. Oh yeah, that'd be funny. That could be funny. It's hey, gonna cost about thirty million. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, I was thinking like Will Ferrell or something. You know, someone that's keep it light, like funny around. He does cracking jokes or something. Peyton's pretty funny too. No, Peyton is. Peyton's really funny. That was a good one. That's 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 a good answer. All right, number two. You guys have an agreement right there. What are you binge watching right now? 
Well, like I said, we just finished the Tiger King, so we're trying to actually find something new to watch. So I would say all of the Game 7s, every hockey game <laughs> on NBC Sports I'm watching, I, I need to stop because I actually have to go to sleep at a <laughs> decent time. Um, Sharks, uh, Vegas game on last night. Uh, that, was, that was running a little bit late for me, but I would say all of the hockey games I've been – We've that, oh, it's so bad because during our workout we have them on, and when it when I know the game's going to end, uh, I stop working out and I have to watch, watch the entire <laughs> ceremony and I have to watch the last few minutes and you just get the chills and you know so you just see the emotion and just to re it's just such a, mm -hmm. a it's, it's, a, it's a, such a happy moment and for both of us we've been able to accomplish our childhood dreams whether it's the Super Bowl or the Olympic gold medal you know you you can relate to those moments and so you just it you pause and nothing else matters but watching uh, that moment. So I would say every uh, hockey yeah. game that's been on, that's been what I've been binge watching. Yeah, you pause as you should. Okay, so what do you miss most, Bo W? What do you miss most about normal life? Oh, man, a lot. <laughs> just being able to go out and just like hang out with your friends somewhere, you know, or even yep. just like, even as an athlete, just going to a gym and working out, you know, just missing all of that. I mean, I guess we have our, we like, we could go to our families and stuff, but even like my parents are a little older. My grandma is like older. She's one of us visiting. So like, it's hard just, you know, obviously socializing is a big thing we miss at least. Yeah. I think for me, it's the uncertainty of, of what's next. Yeah. I'm a big planner. So waking up and not being able to. Yeah, you, you know, miss your routine. Yeah. yeah I miss, yeah. I would say I miss my routine the most yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for joining us, popping on here. We look forward to checking in with you via social and everything else. Uh, gold medalist, Kendall Coin Scofield, Super Bowl champion, Michael Scofield. We really appreciate your guys' time and stay safe. Yeah, yeah. thanks for having thanks us. For having us. Yeah, stay, stay safe, safe, everyone. So we are proud to welcome a sixth career win Indy car racer and James Hedgecliffe. We appreciate you taking some time to do this. I mean, you've got to let's start with the rig that you got going on <laughs> behind you. I mean, what, what is happening? As we go through the coronavirus stuff, what has happened to iCar racing? Explain what's behind you. Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty crazy situation we find ourselves in. You know, obviously, iRacing and sim racing and racing online has existed for a long time. But in lieu of what's happening, with no professional sports really running, this is one of the few things that we can actually do as athletes to kind of put on a sort of real-life show. The, uh, the software has been developed over years. It's got almost every kind of car you could imagine, every racetrack on earth. And, you know, IndyCar is doing it. Obviously, NASCAR has done it now. But we're getting the real drivers into rigs all across the country. And we're all meeting in one place, one time online and having an honest-to-goodness race. So it's really kind of transformed how the, uh, this, this kind of forced off-season has been for us because we went from twiddling our thumbs waiting for the first race to happen to now – you know, probably spending five, six hours a day in these rigs here practicing for the next race. How much communication is there then between the developers of the software and the racers themselves? A lot. I mean, like I said, the iRacing software that we're running in the IndyCar Challenge has been around for a long time. And they've worked over the years with drivers of every different kind of car. They laser scan every racetrack. So the tracks are absolutely to the millimeter, perfect replications mm. of the good thing. And so it's, it's a tool that a lot of guys do use in the off season or to, to learn a new racetrack. Uh, it's something that a lot of us have done. There are a couple guys that have been active on the actual online racing community side of it. And they're absolutely kicking our butts because they've got, you know, a thousand races under their belt. And we're all still trying to figure it out. So give me the inside scoop. What, what, what are the similarities to real racing? What are the differences that you've noticed so far? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, similar to a flight simulator, right, to train pilots, what this is designed to do is to really get you to be able to mimic all the inputs that you would give into a real race car. So the inputs to the steering wheel, the inputs to the throttle, to the brake. And, and in that sense, it does an incredible job. You know, the, the physics of the car model and the software is so accurate that real techniques that you use to go faster in an Indy car around Barber Motorsports Park that's going to make you faster in an Indy car around Barber Motorsports Park and iRacing. Uh, the one thing that you just don't get, and it's the same with pilots, uh, because it's so hard to replicate, is the feeling of G-force. So a lot of these rigs are actually built on platforms that move. They have yaw, they have pitch, they have vibrations. So there are a lot of sensory additions to them. It's, you're not just sitting there in a computer chair. 
but ultimately you're not feeling that force of the G's through the corners under the brakes. They try to replicate it as best they can, but that's one of the biggest differences is you can't really get that feel through like, you know, through the seat of your pants that you get in a real car. How do you describe that feeling? That the one you just mentioned, the G force going 240 or whatever it is in an Indy car. I mean, what is, what is that like to a regular human being? Oh man, that's a, that's a tough one to explain. It's a, uh, it's a surreal feeling going those kind of speeds like they do at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, like you say, 230, 240. The, the force, what's so unique about it is that force is on every single part of your body, you know, so you could, you could grab a steering wheel, you know, set up to some weights in a gym and do this and say, oh, that's how hard the steering wheel is. And you could put uh, a band around your neck and pull on it and be like, okay, so that's how much force your neck gets. But unless you're driving an actual race car, getting every inch of your body to experience that G-force all at the same time, you just really can't replicate it. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very unique feeling for sure. How likely do you think it is that this iCar stuff could become, obviously with Corona going on right now, I mean, this is the ultimate booster uh, for this side of the business, I would assume. How far can this go? I mean, this, can this become a staple of the indie circuit, do you believe, or, or, or what do you think? Look, I mean, it's, it's got value. There's no doubt about it. And I mean, you know, with, uh, with the race this weekend being on NBCSN, you know, it, it's out to our regular TV audience. So all those people that are hungry for IndyCar racing or just motorsports in general, or really just sports in general, you know, it's what's so unique about this is it's not like, you know, guys, hockey players grabbing NHL 2019 and, and playing on a PlayStation or an Xbox. This is so much more advanced and it's so much more down to the, to the driver and the experience they've got that you really can't replicate a, a truly good sporting event. So do I think it's ever going to replace what we're doing on a racetrack? No, I don't. There's nothing that really is quite as cool as the sounds and smells and feelings of Indy cars traveling around Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But does that say that IndyCar doesn't at some point adopt a, a Wednesday night iRacing league? I don't know. I can see there's value for sponsor. It's fun for the drivers. You know, what's unique about our sport, Jack, is – we don't get to practice the way that other sports get to practice. You know, if, if you are a basketball player and you suck at three pointers, you can go stand at any three point line in front of any basket anywhere in the country. And you can practice all day and all night until you're good at three pointers. In the IndyCar series, the rules are very restrictive on how much we get to go testing, to go practice. We only get about four days in the car from the end of one season to the beginning of the next. So, you know, that's like telling LeBron he only gets to practice four times from the end of the championship to the first game. Is racing more physical or more mental, do you think? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think racing is, is a tremendous example of a sport that's, that's so finely balanced between the two. Um, you know, obviously the, the physicality, I think the mental side of it is pretty obvious to people. You know, when you're traveling at 200 miles an hour, you're covering a football field a second. And so if you miss a turning point by one tenth of a second, that's 10 yards. And we're talking about a, a window of error um, that is six inches, maybe a foot. And so you have to be so mentally sharp over the course of 500 miles to make sure. And, and that's just driving through one corner by yourself. You've got to do 800 corners with 32 other cars on track. So it's, it's a massively mentally strenuous task. And I think a lot of people appreciate that. The one thing that we really struggle with is explaining the physicality of these cars to people. And drivers, I mean, we're athletes. We have to train six days a week to be physically fit enough to drive these cars. Those G-forces put a tremendous amount of you know, energy through the body. You've got to be able to manage the car and balance it on the edge of grip through a 3G corner. You know, we don't have power steering, so they're very physical through the steering wheel. You need good neck muscles, good forearm, grip strength. Uh, core muscles, leg muscles. We put almost 2,000 pounds of pressure through the braking system when we hit the brake mm. pedal. So it really is a head-to-toe fitness regime that we've got to follow. And honestly, keeping yourself physically fit really does help with the mental side of the game kind of in that last quarter of a race. So how has the virus changed your physical routine? What are you able to do now that you weren't able to do or vice versa? You know, it hasn't changed a lot. The way we're sort of approaching it is, you know, like, like any sport, you have your training uh, program designed around where in the year you want, right? Yep. So we have an off, a very, very strict off-season, uh, very specific off-season routine. And we had kind of obviously just got to the end of it and it transitioned to the in-season routine for the, the start of the season in St. Pete. And now that we've sort of extended the off season, we've sort of just reverted back to our off season program. So we kind of feel like 
we came out of St. Pete and it was January 1st. And that's kind of the mindset that you've had to put yourself in. It's like, okay, we've now got three months before the season starts. Let's go through the same kind of training that we would have starting January 1st. So take me to the ND 500. The biggest difference between the 500 and any other race that you'll be in around the year. History. That's the difference. The Indianapolis 500 is what started it all. You know, the first race was in 1911. Uh, we've done 103 of them now. And that's really what launched the sport of IndyCar racing. And so when you look at the, the list of past winners, it's a who's who of the greats of the sport. That facility, every time you drive into it, I don't care how many times you've been there, every time you drive through the tunnel at Indy, you come out in the largest sports stadium on earth. You know, this is the home of the largest single day sporting event on earth. Uh, 350,000 people there on race day. And there's just something, there's just an energy about the place, just something about it, you know? And so you could go build a new fancy racetrack and, and you could, you could put all these things, flashy things in it. But the one thing money can't buy is history. And Indy just has more of that than anywhere else. And that's what makes it so special. Uh, so take me to this weekend. We have the iCar race on NBCSN this weekend. If I'm a casual fan, convince me to watch this race. Why, why should I tune in? Why should I be a part of this this weekend? Well, what other live sports are you watching this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> None. No, but in, in all seriousness, I mean, and that, is, that is one good reason. But what, what, it, what is so cool about this is it's online. We are able to replicate so accurately what really happens in a race. And so you've got all these guys that are professional racing drivers, uh, some of them maybe with more, more sim experience than others, but – we're going to real tracks. We're driving the cars. They have very similar handling characteristics as the real thing does. We are going to put on a show that would be as good, if not better, than one of our actual races. And we're doing it in this awesome, cool new way. We're taking advantage of, a, of an unfortunate situation that we're all in. We're, we're finding a silver lining for it. And like I said, you can only rewatch the 2016 Super Bowl so many times. You know who won. You, know, you don't know who won the race on Saturday, so might as well tune in and see. I'm watching that and horse racing with nobody in the stand. So believe me, I'm, I'm going to be tuning in this Saturday. So past or present, this is our lockdown lightning round right now. Okay. Past or present, anyone through time, who would you most want to join your quarantine crew? Oh, wow. Uh, so that's a great question. I mean, I'm assuming we can't like default to the obvious answer like my wife, right? Like I, I got to just say that. You most certainly cannot. Okay, perfect. Um, so, you know, I'm a, I like, I'm a lighthearted guy. I like to laugh and have fun. So I don't want to be quarantined with somebody that made me laugh. So if I had to pick someone, I'd probably go with like Seth MacFarlane or something. Love it. Absolutely love it. All about entertainment. All about an excuse to smile, in my opinion, <laughs> right now. Okay, if you were running for your life in a high-speed pursuit, you can have any car in the world. What car are you in? Oh. Can I have my Indy car? <laughs> any car but your Indy car. Okay, all right, all right. I mean, I'm, I'm breaking all the rules here. Uh, any car, honestly, I would, I would want to try. Uh, I think I'd want an Acura NSX. Oh, okay. Explain what, what, what is that one? Is so, that their souped-up version? Yeah, yeah. Is that's Acura's like supercar, um, hybrid, sports car. It's, uh, it's pretty trick, man. It's pretty fast. It can beat Ferraris and Lambos. It's. Uh, it's a neat little machine. This is the third and final of our lightning round here. How many times have you used your race suit as a porta potty? <laughs> Honestly, just the one time. Once. I've been, it, I've been doing it 10 years, and I made it like eight years without doing it, and I was so proud of that fact. And then one day, it's actually a funny story. I know it's a lightning round. I'm ruining it. but No, nope, please. It's, it's, uh, with all the other questions, this is really the only one that I care about. So please, take your time. <laughs> this is the top three question we get as drivers. Is, you know, How do you go to the bathroom in the race car? And so the situation was we had a race actually at Barber where we're racing this Saturday uh, in the I racing, the IndyCar I racing challenge. And it was raining. So we had a, like a rain delay basically, but we're strapped in the cars, we're ready to go. And we sat there for about an hour and it didn't look like we were going to get to go out. So I asked one of the, the pit officials, Hey, can I go use the bathroom quick? And he said, no, I think we're going to start going. I'm like, there's no way we're going. It's, it's raining more than it was before. He goes, no, I think we're going. And I was dying. I was, dying for a pee and uh they're like all right fire up the cars we're gonna start and i thought oh man so we go out and i'm shaking i'm in so much pain 
and like my foot's shaking on the throttle and it's slipping. I'm like, if I don't do something here, I'm going to crash the car and that's going to be the reason <laughs> that I can't have that. Yep. So it took me a long time. I built up the courage and I let it go. And then like 30 seconds later, the race director came on. He said, no, nah, conditions are too bad. Everybody come back in the pits, get out of the cars. Didn't even have to. <laughs> if I just waited like two more minutes, I don't I kept my, my perfect streak alive, but I've got my, uh, my one uh, mark there. You're one mark, and then five minutes later, you're sitting in the, the lap lane uh, in your own pee. Yeah. What are you Unbelievable gonna do? story. I love it. Okay. <laughs> so we, we've done this one with everybody. The quarantine ID. It's known as, it's known, this is online. This is an interweb thing. You may have seen okay. it on the internet by now. It is the last thing you ate plus your high school mascot. So this is the, uh, I'm the over easy bluebird checking in. Okay. What should we call you? Uh... What was the last thing I ate? I had mine's a, uh, a <laughs> mine's a cheeseburger devil. Okay, you're the devils. I'm the devils. Yeah. There you go, my guy, James. <laughs> this has been a pleasure, man. I, I cannot wait to get involved in this whole indie thing, and I really appreciate you taking some time and explaining uh, all the iCar stuff to us as well. Of course, man. Of course. Hey, go get a wheel and come join us. Anybody can play. Damn right. So just as Hinchcliffe has his eye racing rig preparing him for a return to the track, a rising play-by-play -play superstar has taken to the roof. Welcome inside the broadcast booth, folks, here in Evansville, Indiana, for the Evansville 500, second to last lap. Alex Gould, appreciate you joining us here. Look at this. We got the Mercedes Benz out in front. He's pulling over, not sure what he's doing. Might come into the house at some point. He's getting over to the right hand lane, no license plate. Saw one of those earlier. All of a sudden, you got a kid driving back, social distancing. You got a little bit of a, looks like an Arizona license plate. He's completely lost. He missed his turn a while ago. Again, folks, it's been a wild race. Marvin McFitson still in the lead. He's on his last lap. He's coming around the bend here. You can see here in this beautiful truck, this nice shiny silver truck. He's coming around the bend. He's got the one hand dance, got a little beanie on. I'm pretty sure that's our landlord. He is something special. He drives a Chevy and he's off to the races. He's off to the final leg. There he goes. Speed limit's 20. He's going 200 for the Evansville 500. He has done it.